Hey guys, welcome back to Tech Talk with Anj. And today we're with Yash Sharma, who's a fellow high schooler who's using AI to model how molecules can build themselves and who also runs his own podcast as well. Yash, awesome to have you here. To kick us off, can you tell us a bit about yourself and how you first got interested in science, technology, and research? Yeah, so um, I'm Yash. I'm a senior at Saratoga High School. I, um, well, first, thanks for, thanks for having me on. Yeah, of uh, course. It's great talking to you. Um, yeah, a little bit about myself. I like um, producing songs and flight simulators and movies. Mm. And so um, I first got interested in, you know, science and, and research when uh, it was like sixth grade and I was walking with my mom. And I was, you know, telling her, oh, no, I'm kind of scared that everything is moving at such a fast pace. What mm. happens if, you know, I fall behind? And so I went home and asked my dad that day, um, you know, is there any opportunities, anything like that, that I could sort of get into? And he put me into a class for, uh, it's just like a three-week server program for artificial intelligence. And I started to do that class. Um and I really enjoyed it. And so from that point onwards, it was just about, you know, trying different things and sort of going interdisciplinary, which a lot of my work nowadays is really it. It's in that interdisciplinary area. Wow. Yeah, that's sick. I feel like I can also relate with how I also got interested in AI and my first uh, camp as well. But um, let's talk about specifically your project. Um, for listeners who aren't familiar, can you explain in simple terms what you work on? Um, and what molecular self-assembly is all about. Yeah, so I guess I'll sort of start off with um, what I sort of, uh, well, what molecular self-assembly is. I think you probably have a better idea that way. So molecular self-assembly is when molecules can sort of spontaneously uh, organize into larger and more ordered structures. Mm -hmm. um, and it, it's sort of similar to like... Um, you know, how you'd have uh, Lego bricks being put together, but they're driven by natural chemical interactions. Mm -hmm. And so this is sort of key to understanding how, you know, the first protocells may have actually formed on Earth. Um, and it's also sort of relevant to modern drug delivery today um, and nanotechnology in terms of ma uh, micelles, vesicles, and nanoparticles. Um, and so specifically what I was doing was um, I was generating molecular dynamics data with uh, fatty acids and alkanols um, under different like pH conditions and um, at different temperatures in, mm. you know, these small simulation boxes of 10 to 15 nanometers. And this allowed me to sort of build a data set. Um, where I could uh, model the processes, these self-assembly processes that were happening. Um, and so I built that using um, a GNN, a graph neural network, mm, which yeah. essentially captures spatial interactions, um, which molecules are near each other, you know, how does this carbon have an effect on this hydrogen, so on and so forth, and then a long short-term memory model, which is sort of like a precursor to your normal transformer, and it captures like temporal change, um, how clusters will sort of form, uh, merge, and dissolve over time. So, so you, so you used yeah. a vision transformer, in my right? no, um, because so by creating a molecular dynamic simulation, I actually have um, uh, position data, and so oh. it doesn't require me to necessarily use any sort of um, vision transformer. All I need oh. is that position gotcha, gotcha. data, which gives me trajectories and stuff like that to predict motion frame by frame. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm, interesting. Um, do you do anything else with this project? Uh, do you take it anywhere, or how's yeah, it going? So, so? I mean, I I think I can talk a, a lot about the results, which were actually pretty good because oh, nice. um, this model received a very low prediction error, of, yeah. uh, which is uh, which was actually almost near state of the art, um, as well as the fact that it runs fifty one times faster than uh, mm. molecular dynamic simulations, and so it's sort of matching the accuracy of physics based methods while um, like sort of reducing computational costs. And so, you know, my goal with this project 
uh, is sort of to uh, use this as a basis, use the models that I've created as sort of a basis for um, sort of uh, more systems biology simulations um, and understanding through artificial intelligence. Wow, yeah, that's really interesting. But like what really excites me is like the potential within this field. So I want to ask you, um, what kind of breakthroughs do you think this type of project could unlock in the future? And how might it change drug discovery and healthcare in our everyday communities? Yeah, so I think that if we can predict self-assembly, we can actually design better uh, drug delivery systems. Um, and mm. like... Faster simulations also mean lower costs, which can make uh, more advanced treatments more accessible if we're actually able to to get treatments uh, out to people based on such systems. So, like, I think going more into it, um, current drug development is slow and it's expensive. Yeah. It takes 10 to 15 years um, and billions of dollars to just get a drug to market. Yeah. Right. And so many modern drugs already rely on self assembly, self assembled structures like mm -hmm. micelles, liposomes, nanoparticles. Um, and so if we can sort of simulate and predict self assembly quickly, what happens is that we can design safer carriers, which will probably reduce toxicity and improve targeting. We can cut down on lab trial and error, and we can sort of accelerate uh, the move from idea to drug to clinical trial. And so faster simulations would essentially mean shorter timelines, uh, drugs reach patients sooner, uh, lower costs as therapies sort of become more affordable and accessible and more precision because we have uh, fewer side effects and, and better patient outcomes. Yeah, that's huge. There's a lot of potential we can have with drug discovery and the speed will rapidly like increase. But... Yeah. Um, Let's zoom out a bit further. Uh, do you think we'll ever reach a point where AI can simulate entire living cells or even whole organisms in real time? Is that possible? So it kind of is. Um, I think like the issue with modern molecular dynamic simulations is mm -hmm. that you have like, like at a, at a smaller scale, um, if you have one molecule, right, you have another molecule, it's easy to predict the interactions between that. Yeah. At a larger scale where you have hundreds of thousands of molecules, it's like there's a hundred, there's a hundred thousand different molecules that have an effect on one molecule. And then right next to it, there's another hundred thousand that have an effect on mm. the molecule that's right by it. Right. Yeah, yeah. And so that is going to increase computational costs. And so what artificial intelligence does is um, it, it, it sort of... Uh, allow us to use artificial intelligence to um, sort of integrate uh, layer by layer yeah, uh, yeah. physics rules and laws and simulations um, into uh, large scale simulations. I don't think I'm explaining this correctly. So no, 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 no. That, that makes sense. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. yeah so, yeah. so it, basically just like, um, going from subsystems that are simulated by artificial intelligence yeah. to larger systems that actually are put together uh, based on these very accurate artificial intelligence outputs. Uh, mm -hmm. And these artificial intelligence models will be basically based on, you know, physics and form neural networks, which will sort of blend um, physical laws directly into artificial intelligence models. So mm -hmm. like, I think, Yes, it is 100% possible that we will be getting to the point where we can simulate, um, you know, full organisms. Um, yeah. But it sort of is a question of like, is this even worth it? Like, is it is it worth it for yeah. me to, to be simulating a whole organism? Or is it worth it for me to be simulating, um, you know, like a specific system of an organism and the, you know, sort of relevant subsystems or um, systems that it directly affects the the pathways that it that it, it has an effect on um, and so yeah I, I think it's definitely 100 percent possible mm -hmm. yeah that makes a lot of sense yeah uh, I think you explained it well but basically this tech is pretty powerful and 
one thing I like to do in all my whenever I um, talk about tech is the ethics behind it. Um, do you think certain companies should or there should be a restriction placed on people that would have access to this kind of tech or like certain labs or should it be like open to everyone in general? Yeah. So I think it's more of a matter of data versus tech. Like the tech yeah. is powerful, right? You, yeah. I, I'd say that you'd want as many labs to have this technology as is possible. I think it's really more of a matter of who gets the PHI, who gets this, who gets this data, because that really does make a difference in um, like sort of the large economic scale of things. Um, but yeah, PHI, PHI protection is a lot more important than rather who gets the who gets the technology you want to make sure that you know you're you're following the rules and regulations around patient health information and you want to make sure that people aren't violating any patient rights and i think if we i, I think we definitely do have a lot of regulation in that space i'm not necessarily able to speak to how much because uh, i'm not yeah, a, yeah. Um, yeah i don't i don't do a lot of of stuff in that space but i i do think that the technology itself that should be available to as so, many people as possible. So you're saying the data should be available, but the tech shouldn't? I'm saying that the tech should be available. I'm saying that should, the data okay. should be limited to limited, uh, okay. its availability solely because of patient health information. Like, yeah, give yeah, it yeah, that to makes, people yeah. that you know are, are not going to screw around with it. Yeah. Um, yeah. Okay. Okay. Um, now let's move on to one of the coolest parts about your story and how you're doing this at a high school level. Um, I know a lot of other peop- high schoolers who want to get into research. So what's one piece of advice you could give to others to get started in this field of research? Yeah, so for me, like the way that I got involved with um, high school research was actually the Synopsis Science Fair. Uh, uh, and I started doing that since sixth grade and oh, wow. I kept doing that every single year um, and just seeing different people, different projects. And then eventually like realizing that, you know, there's a lot more that I can be doing. And so I just started to cold reach out to as many uh, professors and people as I can to sort of validate my projects. Um, and so like I was already working on something um, and you know i just wanted some feedback and so that's how i sort of uh started to get research opportunities from universities uh like stanford and uh how i'm able to sort of do more research um and so i think the biggest piece of advice that i'd have is one have a project that you're really passionate about and that you're really interested in that should be like the main thing nothing else matters if you're not passionate the second thing is reach out to um, as many people as you can about that project. And if it just so happens that they're working on maybe the exact same thing or they're working on, or that project is their area of expertise, then that's you know one step closer to a research opportunity. And you're actually showing that, hey, I'm bringing value to you by doing this project. So that's another reason why they'd want you to work with them. So Yash, um, so one thing, um, yeah. Can you talk a little bit about cold emailing? Like, how was it for you? Did you get discouraged at times when people wouldn't respond or they'd maybe yeah. see your message, maybe just ignore it? Like, can you talk yeah. a bit about that? So, yeah, I have a lot of experience with cold emailing, especially with my nonprofit and my podcast. And like 90% mm-hmm. of the time, people don't respond at all. Um, and that's okay because people are people they have they have stuff going on yeah, yeah. Um, so you're not always going to get a response back from people and that's okay um, what you should do is you should just keep going you should just keep reaching out to as many people um, for me yeah I'd say that every one in ten people that you reach out to is going to respond and mm. maybe out of uh, every you know one in five one in ten people that respond that's the only person that's actually going to help you. So you got to reach out to definitely um, a lot of people to to um, make sure that you get um, some of these opportunities. Yeah, so persistence is key, I guess. Yeah, persistence. Yeah. Okay. Um, finally, looking ahead uh, later in your life, what's next for you? 
uh, do you want to keep pushing deeper into AI and molecular science, or do you want to explore other futuristic fields? Yeah, so for me, I think something that I'm really interested in is space and space mm-hmm. medicine. So I'm sort of interested um, a lot with the sort of intersection of the two, um, you know, use computationally accelerated biology for Earth and space. Um, but okay. more specifically, I think that's sort of like long term, my dream of, of what I want to end up doing. But more specifically, in the short term, I want to be focusing my efforts towards precision medicine. And essentially the idea of, you know, looking at somebody's genetic state and their physiological condition. Yeah. And um, and their lifestyle and so on and so forth, yeah. and developing specific targeted treatments for those individuals instead of like a one size fit all approach, which is sort of what we have going on right now. Yeah. And so it's like the same two patients with the same disease might need very different treatments because of differences in genetics, proteins, microbiome, so on and so forth. And so my goal in the future is to sort of deliver or rather develop systems that allow us to deliver the right treatment at the right dose to the patient uh, at the right time. So that's my goal. Uh, And that's hopefully what I want to end up working on and and doing in the future. Yeah, that's a really powerful reason to keep going forward. And I think you already have your plan set out. So that's great. Um, Yash, thank you so much for coming on this episode with me. It's been an inspiring conversation from how you got started to the future possibilities of AI and science and the bigger questions of ethics and impact. Thank you so much for joining me. And to everyone else listening, don't forget to like, subscribe, and leave a comment. See you guys in the next one.